Okay, so you're probably wondering what's a gen jam. Well, if you split the word apart, uh, the two pieces really stand for the genetic jammer. The genetic part comes from genetic algorithms. And jammers are people that go to jam sessions and sit in, okay, which is what Gen Jam does. So Gen Jam uses genetic algorithms to improvise jazz. But the best way to understand what Gen Jam really does is to play a tune. So what I'm going to do is a kind of an annotated performance. And this is a uh, Tad Dameron tune. Better get my trumpet. Um, from the 40s. Uh, we're going to play seven choruses of it. And I'm going to annotate what we're doing as we go to kind of explain what Gen Jam is doing. Thank you. Mm. Well, thanks for the applause. Gives me a chance to get a little sip of water. So uh, how did it do that? How does Gen Jam work? Well, what you just heard was a musical conversation between the two of us. I'm the human, in case you need to know. Um, I was improvising, and as I was improvising, Gen Jam was listening and responding and producing an interactive response, so we had a little conversation going on. Now, Gen Jam needs to know some things about the tune to be able to play on it. I like those chords that you saw going by. It gets to see the chord progression. It knows what tempo to play. Um, it knows what to do for each of those choruses that you saw flying by. Um, we need to also set up the uh, tone generator so that uh, Gen Jam was playing a tenor sax there, or something that was vaguely sounding like a tenor sax. Uh, the piano was panned hard right. The drums were whatever volume, that kind of thing. Uh, there were a couple of MIDI files that got played back. 
One was a head sequence, and that was that harmony part that you saw I kind of penciled in on the score. Uh, the rhythm sequence was the piano, bass, and drums. And to do that, I used, yes, Band in a Box, commercial product, been around for a long time. Uh, hack around with that and, and generate a MIDI file so that if I were to play that tune again, you'd hear exactly the same thing for the piano, bass, and drums, and you'd hear something very different from me and Gen Jam, because I don't know what I did, and Gen Jam's responding to me and making it up as it goes, too. So be very spontaneous there. Okay, so back to the architecture. And the interesting part from the evolutionary computation point of view, and that is the two populations of melodic ideas, a measure population and a phrase population. And this is where the chromosomes live. Chromosomes. Hmm. Well, here's what they look like. Um, what I've got here is a cooked up example to illustrate how the um, uh, architecture works here. Um, I've got here a, a, a phrase out of the phrase population. There's actually 48 phrases that it has on any given tune. Um, and each of those phrases then, if you look at the, the uh, chromosome for that, the genotype basically maps to measures in the measure population. So in here we have a phrase that's measure 57, followed by measure 57, followed by measure 11, followed by measure 38. And there are those measures in the measure population. Let's look at measure 57, the one that got repeated. And what you can see is that its chromosome has eight genes in the genotype. Each gene maps to an eighth note of a 4-4 measure, so there's eight of them in a 4-4 measure. Um, some of those uh, genes can represent rests. Some can represent hold uh, notes or hold events, which means that that's where I get the dot and quarter notes. So that's where the rhythm happens. And uh, a lot of the events represent notes in some scale, roughly two octaves in some scale. And the scale that's used is determined by the chord against which that measure is going to be played. So that's why, even though measure 57 is repeated, in the first measure, we get an E natural for the first event, and it becomes an E flat in the second one. And then that A becomes a G. Um, basically, that's because the scales for a C7 chord and an F7 chord have different notes, so it maps to different notes. Bottom line is, Gen Jam cannot play a theoretically wrong note, unlike me. Okay? And if you can't tell whether I meant to play a wrong note or didn't, I win. Okay, so, yeah, there you go. Well, that's a lot of tech. It's some it's music theory, and believe me, I'm only scratching the surface. There's about three dozen mutation operators under the hood and intelligent crossovers and all kinds of weird stuff. But this is supposed to be a TED talk with ideas worth spreading. So what's the idea worth spreading here? And to do that, to answer that, I need to go back to the title of it. Gen Jam's Journey from Technology to Music. Well, you can take the journey literally because we've been all over the world together playing with this crazy thing over the years. Gotten a lot of nice opportunities, played some interesting places, had some neat concerts and talks. Now I get to add, uh, add uh, TEDx Binghamton to the list, although I don't think I can fit it on the map there. Um, but really what I'm talking about is the subtitle, From Technology to Music. And really what I'm talking about is a journey of perspective. My perspective on what Gen Jam is, what it represents, what it is to me to play with it. I started out, uh, like most technologists, when you start a project like this, with a very technology perspective. Okay, I was looking at it as a technologist, as a, uh, not a computer scientist anymore, I was in the IT department by then, but I was uh, very much looking at the technology. And I figured, well, gee, um, I'll see what I can do with this, try to make it play jazz, and you know, I'll get some papers out of it and get to go to some nice conferences and have some fun there. But, you know, it won't sound that great. I, you know, the music itself, it probably just won't very, be very listenable. But, you know, I'll get some papers out of it. And that perspective then, that technology perspective, uh, is characterized by a focus on the technology, on genetic algorithms. That's what I was studying. I was being a scientist about it. And I was trying to study what genetic algorithms could do. So I had to be really true to the technology. I couldn't cheat on the technology. I had to make the technology uh, correct in order to correctly assess it. And that meant that if the music was not that great, well, I have to bend the music to fit the technology. Trumpet players have to stay um, hydrated, right? There's an implicit goal with this kind of uh, perspective. 
and I see it in the artificial intelligence community, certainly the ev evolutionary computation community, and that is to generate things, results, that are human competitive. And in fact, if you go to the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference every year, there is a competition on human competitive results. It's very cool. And for most of the uh, engineering domains that dominate Gecko, uh, that makes real good sense. But when you deal with an artistic domain, particularly music, human competitive results can lead to this. This is a gentleman named John Wood. He lives out in LA. And he's seen here with his uh, drum machines have no soul bumper stickers, which he gives out unfailingly at the NAM show every year. The NAM show is the National Association of Music Merchants. They have a Mondo trade show, 1,400 plus vendors in Anaheim every January. And Mr. Wood's out there handing out his uh, stickers. If you, if you zoom in on the bumper stickers, it's hard to read, but it says at the bottom, Society for the Rehumanization of American music. And this is a meme that has a lot of traction in society. The idea that technology is anti-human. Nothing new. The Luddites, and believe me, I've had Luddite moments with this. <laughs> um, it, that, that, that's there. Um, the idea that uh, if, if, if technology is used in music in particular, there's something inherently wrong with it. Because music among the art forms is the one that many people consider is the most inherently human. Um, and many of you probably have that attitude. I get it. Um, so how did I start wandering away from that techie perspective? Because that did happen. And where it first started happening was after I got the first version of this thing built. And I'm training new soloists and, you know, listening to it. And, you know, it's not bad. That's, 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 that's not bad. So I figured, well, I'll play a low stakes gig. And in those days at um, RIT, there was a Tuesday treat uh, concert series. It happened in the lobby of the RIT Union at noon on Tuesdays. You'd set up, you'd play a set. People would wander by on their way to the cafeteria to get lunch, and they might stop and listen for a tune or two. Very low stakes gig. So I decided to do one of those. I had like eight tunes was all. Um, and uh, after I finished, an odd thing happened. It seemed odd at the time. The organizer who had signed up for with this thing came out and said, gee, that was nice. When can you come back? Really? So I said, well, let's sign up. You know, I'm a jazz musician. I always you know, take any opportunity for a gig. So um, I signed up for it. And then I went back and started thinking, wow, I better do some more tunes. Um, and gee, if it could do this kind of chord, I could do that tune. So I better add that to it. In other words, I started thinking more about the music and not just the technology. Well, to make a long story fit in a TED talk, I'm still doing gigs with it. But my perspective now <clears throat> is very different. Instead of a technology perspective, my perspective has wandered to a musical perspective. And that's characterized by a focus on straight up jazz. It's the kind of music I like to play with people with this, you know, it's a trade off. Uh, but so it's straight up jazz, and my goal is to make good music. Music that's fun for me to play, hopefully fun for you to listen to. And yeah, there's a genetic algorithm in there someplace, but I've done a lot of weird things to it because I've been very true to the music, and that means I've had to bend the technology to fit the music. Okay, and my explicit goal is that Gen Jam not just be human competitive, which I maintain it probably is, but that it be a good collaborator. So it's about the collaboration with me. So I will argue Gen Jam is creative. Okay. But that doesn't really bother me because the whole point is it makes me more creative. I'm a better trumpet player, better jazz player, have more fun with this thing. I got like 300 tunes. Okay. So really the bottom line here for the talk is it's not about the technology. It's about the music. It's not about the technology. It's about the music. Now, can we generalize this to your lives? Because we're all inundated with technology. And we've seen examples of it. The, 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 the uh, image I remember from the first half was the, the cell phone on the steering wheel as someone is driving. You know, The technology is, is, is breaking so quickly. Well, maybe it's not about the technology. 
Maybe it's about you and your life and what you do. Because the technology is not an end in itself. It should be driven by your experience and what you do. Maybe that's a way to accommodate the technology, if nothing else. So again, it's not about the technology. It's about the music. So if it's about the music, I better play another tune. And uh, now that you know what it uh, sounds like, and you've got a l rougher idea, or a little, little idea, of um, how it works, I'm going to play another tune. This one is going to be another annotated performance, as we had before, but you're going to have to guess the name of the tune. Okay, It's something that a lot of you know. Um, I'll give you some hints along the way, too.